Good morning again, everybody. We are going to try again and go live and third time lucky, I hope. So today I'm gonna to be talking to the wonderful Shakti from Nourished and Nurtured. Um, so she is a holistic chef. She creates the most incredible food. If you haven't actually seen um, her page yet, head on over to and you will be able to see all of the amazing food that she created. Hey, lucky enough to come to the house. Hey, hey, hey. Can you hear me and see me? Okay. Yes, I can. Okay. Yes, I can. Can you plug your earphones back in? Can you plug your earphones back in? I'm so sorry, everybody. No, no, that's okay. No, no, that's Please, okay. You're not a Luddite. Can you plug those earphones back in? Can you plug those earphones back in? Thank you. Thank you. So bad. This is my first time. Totally fine. Totally fine. Okay. Can you hear me? That is <laughs> way better. That is yes. perfect. Can you hear me? This is so bizarre. Hi, honey. Amazing. It's so long since I've seen you. Thank you. <laughs> I know. I know. In, not in the flesh, though. Haven't seen you no, in the flesh for a long no, time. No, no. Wow. You look great. Um, oh, so I know you would. Thanks. Thanks. I, I, I know here. you were doing all these nice um, uh, uh, welcomings to me, but I couldn't hear them because of my technological <laughs> redundancy. Totally fine. So I was actually just saying to everybody that I um, I met you via the gram many moons ago. It was before I was pregnant with Grace. Way think, before so that, then, actually. I think you were only but, just married, actually. Yes. I reckon no, it was like two, it was 2012 no, was, or something. It was a really long time ago. Yeah, yeah, really? yeah. Way before Grace. Yeah, no, I'd been married. Yeah, no, because you oh, came okay. to my house. Yes. And you were oh. just pregnant. Yes. I yes. know. Oh, yes. Mm. Okay, there you go. So that was probably, yeah, maybe five, mm. about five years ago now. So we met via the Gram. So the Gram yeah. bringing people together. Um, so what I would like to know before everybody uh, gets to know a bit more about you is what you have for breakfast, breakfast today? Tea. Tea. I don't. I'm not. Like, I'm not good like you. I'm not a really yes. a breakfast person. No, you know what? Mm. Neither am I anymore. I used to be a real breakfast person, um, but I reckon for probably the last twelve months, I've actually just realised that I don't wake up hungry. I've, so never. I was just eating because I thought I was. Yeah, I think to. for me it's probably an adrenal thing, but it's a force of habit as well. I just have never woken up and gone, oh my God, I've got to eat. I've got friends who are like, kill you if they don't eat within 30 seconds, but not me. No, I pretty well much actually eat in the afternoon yeah. um, and maybe snack. And if I'm cooking, I never eat. When I'm working, I never eat. It's a chef, it's a chef habit. Yeah. Isn't that funny? It's like forced into Basically, fasting. that's my excuse. I've decided that I'm just, I intermittent fast till sometimes 11, 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> It just depends if I'm working and if I'm working with food and I'm cooking, I don't eat any of it except for tasting sometimes. And then I, um, if I'm on a job, I don't eat till I've come home and unpacked because it's sort of like my senses are overstimulated. Really? Yeah. And also because probably an adrenal thing, but pro if I eat, then I want to sit down and rest. And when you're working, you can't sit down and rest. So I just don't eat. Yeah. Just I pick. Mm. So yeah, but it's probably adrenal, something to do with adrenal function as well in all honesty yeah and actually i think um adrenal stuff and thyroid stuff can also really um affect your satiety and your mm. appetite like it really can sometimes when that sort of stuff's really out of whack you just don't have that appetite i think you just and i think then when you go for long periods of time as well where you are suppressing that appetite your body just kind of gets used to not having an appetite or not not needing that stuff it's, it's I, absolutely I, th I think it's i don't know maybe my my inherent personality type or body type is just not to eat. Like if someone turned up and put food in front of me, I'd eat it and I'd be grateful. But for me to cook myself, I'm like, oh no, too yeah. hard. Yeah. So I live on tea, which is kind of, it's a running joke. Yeah. It's a running Do joke you? with everybody. I have these tea. It's a double cup of tea. No, I don't Do drink, drink coffee, coffee. Thank God. Can you imagine me on coffee? Be like me on cocaine. No, no. <laughs> When I was really little, coffee? actually, tiny little, I remember my dad used to get up. We lived in Townsville. He was in the Air Force. And I'd have tomatoes on toast and coffee with him, a little cup of coffee. And it used to make me go to the bathroom. I have a memory of that. And then I stopped. And thank God I didn't ever take up coffee. Because it just, nah, that me, I'm already high enough. I don't need more. 
<laughs> and I don't, and, I, and I'll think of, I've That's got so, to find so the right funny. coffee. No, but I'm obsessive with my tea, and it's a total running joke with, especially within the Vision Quest community and my friends. It's like if you learn how to make the Shakti tea, and, and where's her tea? Where's the travel mug, and where's the tea? Because I have to have the tea. So um, it's, I think it's a comfort so thing. Funny. You know, I think we have certain things that we that we have associations and memories and. and yeah. And is it a particular type of tea? Is there a particular type well, of tea? Yeah, that you English jam? tea. But I drink um, at the moment it's, moment it's Dilmar, but my favourite tea bag tea is uh, Nature's Cuppa. It's just a strong black tea with low in tannins. Yeah. And I have two tea bags, super strong. Yeah. It sits for like five minutes with the lid on, and then I have to add coconut sugar. <laughs> it's actually a dessert spoon. Don't cringe, everybody. And then it's um, milk, <laughs> and it's and it's milk to That's a certain amazing. colour. Like, and I'll know if someone's put everything in together and shaken it. No. Oh no, it's a, it's a taste. It's a it's a it's a sense memory, and it it, it comforts me. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, a holistic chef. And I, yeah, so when I go to a cafe, I'm like, oh my god, it's in this little cup and this little pot, and I'm um, just like, that's all too hard. So I just basically don't go out for tea, or I take my own. <laughs> just, yeah, yeah, bring me water. Yeah, yeah. yeah I got. Water, I lived in America for so please. long. And so I got so used to just traveling, traveling, having my travel mug and going and taking my tea bags and everything with me because in America, they're not a tea culture. So, yeah, and it's just a, you know. They drink that disgusting, they, what they call coffee. But it's yeah, and, and, and they drink um, iced tea. So hot tea for them is like, what? So you just go and take everything and, then, and everywhere yeah. they have milk at truck stops. So you just take everything, the milk's free, you add the milk and Bob's your uncle. So... Um, yeah, and, and people say to me, you know, how many teas have you had today? Because remember, they're double teas. So I try to keep it to three, so six cups a day, in, in effect, which is <laughs> so bad. <laughs> That's like my nana, seriously, my nana. You go to my nana's house and you open up the cupboard and it's like she's preparing in case there's like a world yes. tea shortage. She would have, I reckon, at, at any one time, there would be at least 10 of the massive boxes of like Dilmar tea in there just in case there's some sort of, I don't know, like what the fuck she's preparing for. The end of the tea world. There will never be a shortage of tea in her house. I'm like, how many how many cups of tea do you need to make a day? But realistically, it's probably well, like 20 cups of tea Well, I think too in our here in Australia, and obviously from, it's a British thing, um, you know, you come over, put the kettle on, you know. And so people come over and say, mm. have you got any coffee? I'm like, oh, no, nah. I've got coffee for face scrubs or coffee from three years ago that I took from my <laughs> teacher that's still in the kit. But, um, yeah, I think it's just our culture too, you know, have a cup of tea and everything will be okay. A cup of tea and a, and a, what is it, you know, like a, you know, an Anzac biscuit or something or Kingston or something and, and everything will be well with the world, yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's just a sense memory <laughs> thing for me. And it, it's like, um, well, like, you know, you said, I think you said somewhere in the post, you know, it's like the alcohol thing. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an alcoholic. We are obsessive by nature. And so now I've just transferred some of that obsession. So yeah. if I haven't got my tea mug, I feel like quite, even if it's empty, I'm like, oh, what do I do? It's got to be in the car, even if it's empty, you know. It's, it's, a, it's just another obsessive yeah. thing of the alcoholic. <laughs> I just transfer. I'm going to turn around because the uh, sun's coming over the ridge now. So That's totally fine. Totally fine. Now, um, okay, so yes. Shakti. Is that no? Your I'm not going to tell you my name. birth name. I, don't, I think you know it, but I don't say it because then people, I don't know. It sort of changes things when you tell people your name. But um, my name's a very boring Australian kind of name. Um, my mother was going to call me Madonna, so luckily that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'd be forced to wear like a headset mic and like yeah, exactly. phone booths everywhere, <laughs> exactly. and it just gets awkward. <laughs> Because not many clothes yeah. go over the top My sister of the told me that. But my second name is Angela because I was incredibly premature. And there's some story that goes that I was, you know, to thank the angels for my survival. That was given, that was my second name. So, um, yeah, but Shakti, and so, so Shakti means, or it's from. actually Sakti, means in the yoga world, it means cosmic energy of the universe or the feminine principle. So you're Shakti or women are Shakti. And in yoga, or, or, you know, those names you hear, all the women's yoga names, a lot of them are the faces of Shakti. So Shakti is the feminine principle, and then all of the other names are aspects of Shakti. Um, and I trained in a yoga lineage in America called Shivananda. It's a very traditional Indian lineage. And they, in the old days, the guru would have just come up and 
here's your name. But in this lineage now, you choose a mantra if, you'd so, if you want to, about halfway through your training. It's four weeks. It's very intense. And my mantra, which I will share, is Om Namah Shivaya. And Om Namah Shivaya is the mantra of Lord Shiva. And Shiva is the other aspect of creation. Shakti and Shiva, they dance together and creation is born, is one way of looking at it. The dance of Prakriti. And um, so because I chose Shiva, there was only three women, in, in, funnily enough, that chose that mantra and no men and all of those women were given a version of a, a Shiva or something to do with Shiva I guess. So the other one was Maheshwari and um, I can't think of the other one and I was given Shakti and funnily enough I wanted that name which you can't ch ask it's totally ego you know it's totally in your ego and I was really close to the priest there's Brahmin priests that uh, are involved with our process and I said to him oh you know I want to be called Shakti and he's like no no I think uh, Durga or, or you know, Maheshwari and I'm like, no, Shakti. And so when I was given the name, you, you, it's at the end of the training and you go in and um, you sit in front of the, you know, you're sitting, all sitting there and then they say, you know, X, Y, Z name, my birth name and then Shakti and I literally left my body. It was like, in you know, like a past life kind of thing. I literally just for a few seconds and I was crying and I had to you know, be blessed by the, 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 um, the priests and they give, Shaivites have three stripes. And then I had to go to my, one of my other teacher swamis and I was sitting the wrong way and doing all the wrong things because I was so like excited. Then afterwards everyone said, you're so Shakti because Shakti is energy, you know, and I have a lot of energy, think fast, move fast. So it was very apropos. apropos. And the next day, the, the head of the, um, of that particular, that particular place said, you know, you're given these names to embody them in your life as you move forward. If you so choose, and if you choose to keep your name as the name you, you're known by, you then do your best to embody the energy of your name. And the energy of Shakti is, is energy, you know. It's, it sort of just made sense. Uh -huh. it, it felt very, at the time, and still does, it felt very much like it was part of this contract in this life to go along and do that, to then have this name. And how old were you? It was 20... How old were you when that 20... I think 2006, so I was th in my late 30s, okay. I'm 52 now, so yeah. Ca so you came back? Well, well no, I haven't, but I, 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 Facebook, I was kicked out of America not long after, maybe within a year and a half, as happens for yacht people, because I was on yachts, and, um, and I was in Mexico and I had no way to communicate with everybody, and Facebook had sort of just had taken off, and I didn't want to be, my last name is Smuka. And I didn't want to be Shakti Smuka. That sounded ridiculous. So I thought, I'll just choose a name that goes with Shakti. And so <laughs> Grace it was. And I thought Grace is just such a beautiful name, as you, as you know. And um, such a beautiful word to embody. And it, I thought it worked very well. So Shakti Grace. And then I came back to Australia not long after. And some of my, my sister and my closest friends would just refer to me as Shakti Grace. It was like a song. And so I was like, oh, well, we're stuck with that. So that's what I use for business. And that's what my, everything, apart from any le anything legal I have to do, that's how I'm known, even by my friends. Though sometimes when I'm with really old friends, they'll refer to me as my birth name in the third person present, like as if I'm not there. But no, I'm like, and they're yeah. like, oh, sorry, it's so hard. And I'm yeah. like, well, you've had a long time to practice now. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get on board, so, get on yeah, board. Yeah. So, so can we talk about your background? So you're a chef. So when did, is that what you had no, always wanted no. to be? Is that? And so I, went? first I was in advertising when I was young. Um, I left school, I was really young in school. So I was able to do HSC twice due to the death of my mother. I went back. And then when I moved to Sydney, I think I was a receptionist and then I ended up in advertising and I went for a job thinking it was a receptionist job and it wasn't, it was in the media department. And then, <laughs> Next thing you know, um, and that's back in the halcyon days of, you know, drinking at five o'clock, you know, I'd be getting the gin cart and going around to everyone and giving them their drinks. Like there's so much booze in those days in advertising. I'm sure there still is. Um, and the next thing you know, I don't know, maybe five years or so at least, I was just in advertising and just working my way up uh, in, within the media department. So this is way before computers and emails. This is a long time ago, kids. Um, and then I loved it, but I didn't like the idea that I had to publicly speak in front in meetings. I didn't have the confidence, um, which for you knowing me seems rather ironic. 
but it was you know I was really sort of a, a nervous sort of person and and I don't know I, again I very much believe we have certain things we have to fulfill in this life so by some I, I broke my leg and I won some I got some money from that I sued uh, sued an establishment and then I ended up in Port Douglas and when the money came through I was like I'm just going to go overseas and so I, I sailed up the Red Sea on a, on a boat, a little 50 footer. And then I ended up in Europe and then I looked after old people and stuff. And then I sort of was 29, you know, the classic time from an astrological point of view to for things to change. And I got back to Australia. I was like, what am I going to do? And my sister had always cooked really well, my older sister. And I was like, I'm going to go to TAFE. I'm going to learn to be a chef. And so at 29, nearly 30, off I went to TAFE and um, started to cook and I was also working in catering just as like a dishwasher and and like an assistant but like yeah. it's hard work and, and then and you get so much shit because oh, I was yeah. the only sort of 30 year old at school and then I ended up working in this really high-end caterer really well-known caterer now in Sydney and uh, I got a job working for Rupert Murdoch on his yacht and it just just yeah th again through a bizarre set of circumstances and I got the job and then that propelled me so the chefing thing, I don't really know what I originally was going to do with it, but I just liked playing with food. Um, but I knew I never wanted to be an a la carte chef because I felt too old and it's very much a man's game, especially back then. And you just get treated so horribly. I mean, it's horrible in kitchens, especially, I mean, it's just, yeah, especially then. And so I like the idea of catering and that flexibility, even though there's still sort of that behavior. And then I ended up on yachts and it's good money it's hard work and it was like the the first yacht was really a trial by fire you know back then you're making everything from scratch and totally puritanical um and then the next thing you know i was in europe in 1998 and i was on yachts ostensibly until sort of 20 i don't know well, really still even now a little bit but hardcore until around 20 2009 when I got bounced out of the States. So, you know, a long yeah. time, a long time. And I, in the middle of that, I got sober. So and in yachts, because often I would be alone in the galley, you, I just, you sort of just figure it out. And I think that's where the skill set comes from. It's a very unique skill set, that particular type of cooking, because you've got limited um, yeah. facilities to provision. You're often out, you've got one fridge to feed like 20 people for 10 days. You have to like ripen all your vegetables on your bunk. You know, on, on these are on like, you know, average size yachts, 140 footers or something, which is average in the yachting industry. Um, but, you, but you learn, yeah. you know, you learn. And I think for me, one of my owners, who was a Tur well, well known Turkish man, said that, you know, he said, you have uh, food in your fingers, food in your hands. It like it, it comes through you. And I, and I very much think that's for a lot of people, like the really good chefs, it's just, it's in their spirit and it just gets translated in their hands. So that doesn't answer your question, but that was yeah. my story. And I love the idea that if you are able to cook and cook well, that you can nourish people. You know, even if it's, if it's white sugar and yeah. white flour, it's still, it's something in your heart. And I love that, you know. So for me, that, that really is why I love it. Well, I think you have, I think you have a very um, different way of cooking. So... I mean, you know, you watch MasterChef or My Kitchen Rules or all of these sorts of shows now that are so, so popular. Um, but the food you create is a real alchemy. There's so much. Firstly, it's beautiful. Like you create the most beautiful food, which I think is completely enviable because I struggle to make things look nice enough that I can actually take a photo of it to put it on Instagram because most of the time it's like slop on a plate. And sure, it's nourishing, but it does not look good. Whereas you create beautiful things, but there's also such a um, almost like medicinal nourishing. It's like next level what you create. Mm. Where did that come from? Oh, thank from? you, Shan. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I, I haven't cooked really like that for so long because I've had a really intense six months or so. Um, I, I think for me, I, I really am always been very drawn well, as you know, to kind of the more weirder things and the crystals and all that stuff way before it was cool. But in the herbal medicine for me and, and just plants, plant medicine. Mm. So it's all medicine. Food's all medicine, yeah. especially if it's done. I mean, even if, again, if it's McDonald's and you bless it, it's still got a better frequency than if you don't. But 
For me, I think that whole herbal thing, I don't know where it came in. Again, this is sort of like, you know, the, the early era of social media or Instagram. But I, I, I don't know, it just sort of comes. And then I'll go off and sort of investigate on, online. And then as I'm working with the food, I mean, often it's still something that somebody else has created. I mean, nothing is really that new. But then it just comes through you. Again, just like with the products, it's, it's that alchemy of, oh, and it just comes through. I don't know. Um, but to create that as a, as a, like in a restaurant or to create that, you know, to make it a financially viable thing, that's not always the case, you know. It's more just me scratching an itch, but a creative itch. So I guess, yeah, it, I love the idea of using the actual medicine of herbs and plants into food. That just, to me, is just a beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, but again, to maybe translate that to a, a client's lunch, that's not going to be a profitable thing. And that's, that's the, the tricky thing with social media these days, is it makes it look like you can do this, but you can't, actually. So someone goes, well, I love what you do there. And I'm like, well, yeah, to do that for you, it's going to cost like you know, this much money. And they don't like that, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So um, you have mentioned a few times that you. Now, do we? Do you say that you are an alcoholic? No, no, you're you always an alcoholic? an alcoholic, an addict, an addict, an addict. In my opinion, um, you, mm -hmm. the way they talk about it, I'll use you know the the, the, the paradigm of or the, the the filter of Alcoholics Anonymous because that's how I, I sort of the tool I used to get sober in the early days. Um, in that thinking, yep. you're an alcoholic. And then, you, so when you're drinking, you're an active alcoholic. When you're not, you're just an alcoholic who's not, you're not active anymore. I mean, it's still playing out, as I said, in other ways. My obsessive behavior, it's an obsession. So they say yeah. it's an, a mental obsession combined with a physical compulsion. So I'm mentally obsessed, I'm obsessed yeah. to drink, and then I physically am compelled. And then, then it's almost like a, there's some sort of, I'm, I mean, your friend may have talked about this. It's like a neural pathway just gets re-exploded. Um, and for me, it's in my family. I very much am of the thinking that it is a genetic thing as well. It's, in, it's within the, the bloodlines and it's all, it's rampant in my family. So I kind of knew from a young age that there was no getting out of way out of this. So once, you know, you're sort of drinking, 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 then you get onto yods, cocaine, 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 and then you suddenly realize. When did you start oh, drinking? You know, just like everybody else. I mean, like I said, I had a career for a long time that was completely about drugs and alcohol. Uh, and then hospitality, again, dry. I mean, I, they, they say that alcoholics and addicts will find the things that allow them to express their addiction. And that's exactly, in, you know, what I did. Um, yachting industry is a massive pile yeah. of drugs and alcohol. So I found things where I didn't have to look like, a, I mean, again, it's not conscious, where I didn't, it wasn't that different. So, um, but I knew from a young age, I remember my dad was sober at this point. And I did a talk at school on it. I was doing this thing back in those days where you went to university to do your HSC. It was a program they did back in the 80s. And I did this thing in psychology on alcoholism. So I sat down and spoke to him about it. And I remember thinking, this will be me. And he used to tell me the little tricks that he used to do. And I was very aware of his alcoholism because I'd seen him get sober time and time again. And then, you know, you sort of just go off and chart your, you know, your path of happy destiny in your life. And then they say, they'll say in AA that there's a couple of things that'll show up. You'll lose your friends, you'll lose your work, and then you'll kind of just lose yourself. It's actually phrased differently, but that's, that's to simply put it. And I was constantly losing jobs on yachts through my behavior. And I was saying to a friend the other day, it wasn't that I was doing things actually that different to everybody else. I was just always the one that got caught because I was such a, I'm such a mouthy fucking bitch, you know? Yeah. So... But you kind of, it's yeah. almost like I, I've always had these dual worlds where, the, you know, there was good and evil. So there was some force of spirit always saying, you know, you've got to stop this. But the addiction, the disease was stronger. And then it took me to some really bad places, very unsafe places. It's a miracle I got out alive. And an absolute miracle. And so when people qu question Oh, you like, mean? you know, you, uh, oh, yeah, sexual that? abuse, put myself into dire situations. Um, oh, just really dangerous. Should have been dead. Should have died. Like one time I was admitted to hospital with a blood alcohol of 0.4. I should have been in a coma because it just goes straight to your brain, you know. And 
Yeah. And I had two drinks or something, you know. Next thing you know, I was on the floor of a bar with my head smashed. Um, and everyone else is drinking. Just as everyone's drunker, actually. You know, that was the thing. Again, it always felt to me, and it still does, like there was this just this thing going, okay, if you're not going to get your shit together, we're going to make you. There's this force of, of, of what I would call great spirit or my higher self. And even when I was hospitalised, I was drinking the next day in Manhattan. You know, that's, and that's what they'll say. I mean, alcohol addiction is insanity. You do things that are to a normal person who doesn't have any sort of addictive uh, traits. It's, in, it's absolutely like, it's insane. But when you're in it, and especially because alcohol is so, it's so part of the cultural context, it's so much easier to take yeah. yourself to those places. And I always knew it was like I had some sort of amazing force of, of protection because I really should have got, not gotten out alive. And eventually I ended up in Newport, Rhode Island, and I kept ending up in this library, and I'd be hung over in front of the big book of AA. And I kept reading it, and I was like, oh, the, the jig's up. I can't. I can't keep doing this. I'm going to die. So I was at the precipice. So while this was, I'm all, still working. While this was all happening. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So you're a functioning yeah. alcoholic. So do, do you realise, though, that you have a problem or do you just think that you're having fun like everyone I think else? For me, and again, I can only speak from my experience, um, of course, I, I think it's, yeah. it's a dual thing. Like I said, there was, there was always this sort of, you know, I'd hear things, like kind of clairaudient sort of telling me don't but again the disease because it is a disease it's a disease of insanity it's insanity it's it's a mental disorder it was stronger and then suddenly your life you get so used to living your life through this context or pretext um or subterfuge or illusion which is which what it is that you think that that's the only way you can survive so you don't you honest i did not know not you i did not know how to not function in the world without alcohol as a device and some days I still don't, you know, six, 17, nearly 17 years later. It's a powerful spirit. <laughs> That's why they call them spirits. So yeah. you know, but it's almost like, and this is why they say in AA or in addiction, recovery, you have to get to your own rock bottom. And my rock bottom was obviously different to some other people's rock bottoms. My first boyfriend was a heroin addict. I knew heroin. Yeah. I knew lots of drug addicts. I knew what it looked like. I had seen my family. Um, but it's like, you, it's like, luckily I had some form of self-preservation. You know, I'd seen young people die in front of me. Yeah. But in that moment, I, I always feel that spirit, you know, my higher self, the spirit that sort of is divining our lives or my life stepped in and said, okay, it's now or never. Yeah, and I still, and like, it was a plan. It was a plan. So I still happened? said, okay, on this day I'm getting sober. And I was one day late. And luckily... For me, it was on an equinox, yep. which is in a very powerful portal to do these things, as it turns out. Um, and then that was yeah. that. I just kind of knew that I, I, yeah, and then you go to your first meeting, and I'm in Fort Lauderdale in America, and they're like, the Americans are so excited when someone. And so how, how, did you get, how did you get sober? You yeah, just said, that's it, yeah. I couldn't go into rehab because I couldn't afford it over there. And I, all these people have been put in front of me who were chefs in the industry who had already got sober, and they said, when are you ready? And so I called them. They're like, well, just do it now. And I'm like, no, on this day. It has to be this date. And so I didn't even have a very fun last drinking. I was like, oh, in hindsight, God, I could have gone out with a bottle of Grange or something. But no, um, it was a horrible last night. Um, <laughs> but, and then I went to AA and they get so excited, so excited over there. And it was like a hardcore meeting with, you know, lots of people who obviously had very hard lives. And they just help you feel so excited about the idea of being sober. And one came up to me and said, you you know, you're going to see that this is going to be the best thing. And so within a few days, I was offered a job with an ex a boss of mine on a yacht in their home, but somehow he'd heard about the drinking, and I just said, no, I'm going to go home, sir. And so within a couple of days, within 10 days, I was back in Australia, which I did never wanted to come back home to Australia. America was home. And, and then I just kind of primed all my friends and said, you can't come and see me if you're going to have drink alcohol and, you know. And, um, and then I just hit, I did an AA hardcore. Because it, it is, you, do, you need it. You need something to relate to that is helping you go through this process. And for me, that, that worked. And so how often I don't do you really go? do meetings anymore. And how often I don't do, do meetings go? anymore, really. I, I'm, a, I'm not okay. ashamed to say. Yeah, oh, but at the time? They say in the beginning, nanny meetings in nanny days. So you're doing a meeting every day for three months, yeah. Yeah, and okay. you've got a sponsor. And 
you know, yeah. you're trying to work the steps. Yeah. And um, at, at, at that time, you, you actually, I remember seeing a lot of these women I got sober with at the same time. You see us go from like deer in the headlights and suddenly our faces had all softened and our bodies had softened. And then I watched that as other people I saw got sober. Like your whole body, it's just like everything's just exhaling because it's such a, at the, at the end of an addiction or at the end of your active part of your addiction, your whole life is about how do you fulfill that? So the lying and the bullshit that goes with keeping that story alive is incredibly exhausting. It really is, even for alcoholics. And so, sorry. And so the yoga came mm -hmm. after you got sober. I was going to yoga, hungover as sin. I was already practicing in a, in a yoga studio in Fort Lauderdale. That's a really fantastic Shivananda studio. And Shivananda is, is the master of Satchananda in Australia. And back in the old days when I was in my 20s, they used to teach like they teach Shivananda in America. It's changed in Australia now. And so, no, I was still going to yoga. I was still doing all the... All of that was already in existence. So there was already that part of my life already operating. And then the addiction and the alcohol and the coke, you know. Cocaine, especially in the States. Um, so again, it was like these two forces were trying to... to, to, to battle you know and i remember i'd be doing handstands yeah. and headstands as hung over as sin you know strong yoga practice and then i'd take people from uh, uh aa to yoga once we got, got sober yeah in those early days and when i went back to america again when i was sober <laughs> i'd take people to meeting to from meetings to yoga because i knew the benefits of it and that's in the end why i wanted to be a, a yoga teacher was to one day maybe go and work with people in detox um, that's kind of not sort of happened yeah. but Yeah. And so I haven't, I haven't had a drink. I mean, I've accidentally had a drink. People have given me vodka waters and stuff like that and spat it out, but I've not actually picked up a drink since then, since September, 2022, 2002. Yeah. So yeah, Amazing. you know, it is, it takes a lot of courage. And one person said to me when I got back to Australia in, in a meeting, she said, you'll see that you chose this in this life. You chose to break this cycle, and I very much believe that. It's like a, it's a, like a bloodline thing, yeah. and part of my work is to, is to cut that. Because it, it travels, they say, in the Native American yeah. traditions, all shamanic traditions, whenever you heal something, you're healing it seven generations forward, seven generations back, even if you don't have children. It's like a, it just goes through the lineages, and it clears that. So one day at a time, though. Yeah. I mean, I, I can pick up a drink any day. So you, you, you always have to be vigilant. And, and diligent. It's not something that yeah. you, um, yeah. oh, you've stopped and it's been so long, so now you can have a little cheeky drink. No, one drink's too many, and then a hundred's never enough. And I'm not going to have one drink. I'm going to have yeah. five thousand. <laughs> so, it's um, yeah. best yeah. that I just don't. And whether or not that's a, a, a story I've told myself, it's really irrelevant because I know where it took me. And I don't choose to go back there, you know. Yeah. My, I, I, I'm still, again, an addict. The mental stuff is still going on. It's just not manifesting in that way. So, yeah. Yeah. So you, you've mentioned Native American traditions a few times. Can you tell me a bit about that? Because that was totally close. <coughs> and when did that come into life and how does that, what does that look like in your life now? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, again... Many lifetimes, many, many lifetimes, for sure. Even my teacher says that. It's in your DNA. Um, the first time I ended up in a sweat lodge, and the Native American sweat lodge was in Ari Sedona, Arizona, of all places, of course, we, you know, in highly, uh, a highly highly charged area. There's a lot of vortexes and stuff. It's quite a spectacular place. And I was, li I was living in the Bahamas on a yacht working, and I had some time off over Christmas, and I ended up on this breathwork retreat with my teacher David Elliott and the second day I think we were taken to this sweat lodge and I don't know if I remember in that moment I'm home but something within me remembered it it was like being at home and the sweat lodge represents the grant the womb of the grandmother earth or the mother earth and the womb of our mothers so right. there's a there's a there's a de and again a, a memory for most people and it was hard and then the next thing you know, a couple of years later, I'm in the ashram. I've just finished my yoga teacher training and become Shakti, or being named Shakti. And there's a sweat lodge on there for four days with this medicine woman from Canada. And of course I stay. And then I get back to Australia and within a week, I'm sitting in a sweat lodge in the Byron Bay hinterland and then working on those sweat lodges. You know, it, again, 
as my my teacher says. You, so you, what is that? What sorry. Is, sorry. What what is a sweat lodge and what's the what's mm, the purpose? Okay, of it? so it's known as a sweat lodge in the West. The sweat lodge in the tradition I walk is Lakota, and we call them an anipi. And the anipi is a purification. It's a purification process, a purification ceremony. Right. But usually this particular part of okay. this ceremony, the anipi or the sweat lodge, it's, it bookends other ceremonies. So when we run our vision quest, you, we, as a quester, you start with two rounds of a sweat lodge and you finish with two rounds. After we do a, a ceremony, a plant ceremony, we finish with a sweat lodge. It's, it's always like to purify and it's also a standalone. So I, I, I can run sweat lodges. I'm a water pourer, a sweat lodge. And the whole thing is that you design is you, you, we heat up rocks, ideally volcanic, and they're called the stone people, and they represent the memory of the planet. And the fire, which is the genesis of all of our lives, the sun, if we didn't have sun, we wouldn't be alive. So the fire is highly respected in all shamanic traditions, really. And so the rocks are heated in a fire, and the sweat lodge is a dome, and it's covered in tarps. So it's a structure that's usually uh, not covered, and then it's covered for ceremony. It's covered in tarps, which are breathable, yeah. And then there's a hole in the middle and we go into the sweat lodge and then the rocks are brought in over a certain period of time and it increases, seven per round usually in this tradition. And as the rocks come in, the door, there's like a flap that's closed and then you're in the darkness and you're in the hot. So you're back in the womb. And the rocks, as they're heated and then the water is poured on them, it, they believe that it releases the memory of the, of the, of the, of, of the healing for the planet or just releases the memories. But the process of the hot, the heat and the dark is to help you heal on all levels, physical, emotional, spiritual, causal, every level of existence. And yeah. I mean, there's many multi-layered symbolisms around the sweat lodge. Um, such a strong detoxification process, that sweating is just well, a insane detox It gets into your joints, your into your fascia, but also it's a, it's a spirit, it's a mental a, f a physical but a spiritual mm. detox because you're meeting yourself in the darkness and that's when people get scared because yeah. the ego which is the mind is designed to keep us safe on the way the ego wants to be you put someone into a sweat lodge or any of these intense healing experiences the mind is going to do everything you can to get out but the spirit which is our heart and our spirits want us to be there wants us to heal so people that come to this work i'm like there's no there's no there's no it's not by chance you've got here. Something greater than you has brought you here. Whether you believe it or not, it's, it is the truth of it. And just like it got me to the Bahama, to, the, to Arizona to remind me, to wake me up. And for me, Sweat Lodge, out of all of the ceremonies that we can do, I love it because it's very much, they call these the animistic traditions. You're very much with the, with the creation. You're on the earth, you're with the heat, you're with the fire, you're with all the elements really. And it's, it's, it, it transcends, like yoga, when you're truly in a yogic place or in a meditation, you're transcending the mind, which is the idea of all of these traditions, really. It's to help us get out of our heads. Because the heads are great, but they also rule us in not the most beneficial way. Um, you know, when I was on, in the ashram that weekend, I saw a bunch of people from New York, from AA, who were there specifically to do healing in Sweat Lodge. Like it's a powerful tool. Uh, and for me, it's like going home and it's hard. And you can be sitting, I could have you next to me and my chief next to me and then someone else, depending on where you are in the lodge, but depending on what's going on in the individual's life, it's gonna hit them harder or, or lesser. It's gonna be a more difficult or challenging experience. And how long are Depends. you in there for? With my teacher, because they're, 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 that ritual is purely to mark the end of something. It's very fast. He, he pours fast and hard. And, but for me, if I was running a ceremony for women, specific, and the weekend was geared around this, uh, a couple of hours at least. You know? But it, the door's coming up and down, the rocks yeah. are coming okay. in. And, and then the drum's going, there's a drum, and people, yeah. you're singing, and the voice and all of that, it helps you transcend again the mind. Because that's what we're trying to uh, uh, see the illusion of, you know, the mind. It, it, it's, a tr it's a trickster. So, yeah. yeah, I love it. I love it. I love it. So there's lots of other stuff that I've heard, um, like around that Native American shaman sort of stuff around, I can't even remember what it's 
whole, but there's different types of um, psychedelic drugs that medicines take. never never none of drugs yeah, to, then, to get that yeah. same they're not drugs i mean we have to be yeah, careful okay, i mean we have to be careful because this isn't a public forum but you know i i all yeah. i can say about the medicines is is that they are medicines and if you look at the way the shamans in peru or the mexicans who are the carriers of the peyote the the hikori the the yeah. kayumari um hikori they're, they're all plant matter, they're just aren't plants they? they're, like, they're plants they're it's plants. a cactus and it's some shrubs yeah. and they believe that say that the, often the spirit of the tobacco tobacco is highly highly revered in all of these traditions especially the native american tradition it's highly we pray with tobacco you know if you have tobacco and you're praying you must never speak an untruth it's like the biggest sort of sin ever kind of thing or the pipe i'm a pipe carrier chalupa carrier and i pray with my pipe we don't inhale the tobacco, but we, we, they believe that the spirit, just to segue, the spirit of the, you put your prayer in the tobacco and as you smoke it, the prayers are taken up to spirit. Because again, in, in this paradigm, God is great spirit, you know, um, great creator, wonk and tonka. So the medicines that is believed that the shamans in Peru, for example, were, you know, in their dreaming, which I think was partially with tobacco maybe, they were told, go and find these plants, do this with these plants, and these plants will offer healing to your people. And that's and now, in this time, right now on the planet, it's believed that these plants are now travelling to all the corners. So they're not just being worked with in their indigenous lands. And this would be for any of these plants and any traditions, really, but the ones I work with or I'm, I'm connected to, they're now travelling to all these other places because we all need healing. And there's a... Uh, my teacher is is called a carrier of the condor eagle medicine, which is a condor is the, the big bird of the south and the eagle is the bird of the north. And they believe, the Hopis had a prophecy that when they, they, those two birds flew together, when their, their work, their healing, their medicines, their teachings, that the, the rainbow children of the world would unite, which is us. So it, it, this is the time, this is why these medicines are so prevalent. Within that... There's a lot of people <laughs> all over the world, but let's talk about Australia, who are working with these plants now in a, in a, in a public setting that is not appropriate. You know? And I'm, I'm a stickler for all these traditions. Like, you know, if you're going to run a ceremony, then it has to be with an elder or someone who has an elder un, uh, above them. You know, if you're going to run it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, not only is there tradition, mm. not only is there tradition mm. and respect mm. for the process, but there's also people's safety. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, I mean, this stuff, from, from from what I hear, can be very, very powerful and make people do quite strange things sometimes. Mm. It's not the, safe for any brand to just go the stra- doing the strange that things. Backyard, <laughs> well, and it happens. People, people are doing it in, you know, God, they're using it as a recreational drug now, uh, ayahuasca. It's terrifying. And I hear the stories because people come to me. Um, it, it, absolutely, Shan. You know, these plants... The plants will never hurt you. It's the people who are running the ceremonies that are creating the, the, the space that hurts people. It's not the plants. The plants, the plants are, it is believed the plants are high dimensional. They're highly, highly intelligent medicines, but the people who are running the ceremonies and creating the space, if it's not held in a safe way, that's where the danger starts. Um, I think there's a story of a kid that died in Peru, yeah. and I don't think it was even medicine. It was maybe something to do with tobacco, but he, was, he had a severe mental illness and should not even have been there. You know, again, th- th- it, it can't, and I, this is something that I say with Vision Quest as well, it comes down to our own personal responsibility and accountability. If, you shouldn't, if you're suffering a severe trauma, you don't go and sit in a plant medicine ceremony. It's not the place. You do other work first. You know? It's not the place to, to work through that. You don't come out of a... You know, you don't come out of a rehab and go and sit medicine, you know. And for me, it took a long time to get to the plants because I was so concerned. But I also see the benefits of them. It's like a slow journey. It's not a, I go and sit with medicines and hallelujah and I'm, I'm saved and I'm God and, you know, no, no, no. It's, a, it's, a, it's like meeting yeah. a wise, 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 wise elder and very slowly the, the onion skin. Again, analogy they use in AA, the onion skin. Is peeled back so I, I highly recommend it for everybody who can meet it in a safe way highly recommend it because I also see the benefits um, 
but but if yeah. you don't want to sit plant medicines sweat lodges and things like that are just as powerful and in breath work everyone's doing breath work now yeah. i'm a, tra a trained breath work teacher or facilitator breath work is also incredibly powerful you know, so um but i think we're all you know we're all children of the earth at the end of the day and and just like now we're sitting in creation you know we're sitting with the trees they've all got something to share with us and and something to teach us you know yeah. look at the way that a tree reacts when it's in a storm you know it's, yeah. it's obvious so yeah yeah and so yeah so thank you so <laughs> thank you all that stuff um, can you please tell everybody a bit about what you're actually doing now? So you're doing catering and then you also have your Nourished and Nurtured product line. So can you tell everyone a bit about um, the catering, where you do it and where they can actually find you if they want you to cook for them? And also a bit about your Nourished and Nurtured product line and what that is, who it's beneficial for, all that jazz. Okay, so catering, yeah, I'm focused mostly at the moment on catering, private stuff, um, you know, usually around 50 mm -hmm. is the max, 50 to 60, but, um, you know, often like last weekend I did like a hens thing, which was just hysterical, again, talking about alcohol and its impact. Um, so they're buffets, buffets are great, you know, um, or I'll do private dinner parties or I'll do ret retreat catering, uh, often not usually for the sort of the Native American work, but other people running retreats, yoga retreats and stuff, because that's very much focused on the yeah. style of food that I kind of operate on. Um, yeah. And then, yeah. so uh, well, I'll, do, I'll go anywhere to do anything if people want to fly me there and set me up with a kitchen so that, you know, there's no boundary. But mostly I live on the central coast in New South yeah. Wales, in, outside of Sydney, so I generally do Sydney. You know, I went to Palm Beach on the weekend. I went to Jewel the weekend before. And then locally, but you know, you have to go where the work is. And if the work's a two hour drive, then that's where you've got to go because there's just not enough, not, an, yeah. not, not, there's not enough work. It's not as available locally as it is in Sydney, you know, and there's a lot of people catering these days. So, yeah. and, and, and bloggers turning caterers and stuff. Um, so there's that. I've had people ask me if I would cater for events. I'm like, no. It's it's hard. No it's way hard, and I will not. Do it's that. not a massive return on the investment. Um, for the for the caterer, it's a, it's really it's it's, it's really hard. hard work, guys. Like I can't believe. I said to a a, a client. Uh, the other last week, I said, you know, if you look at some of the high profile Instagram pages, and then you think that that can be created for the budget that you want to pay, like you're on drugs. It's not. It is impossible. It's, but mostly what people don't understand often when they're paying for a, even a private chef is you're not paying as if it's a restaurant, you know. There's a lot of hours in restaurants. There's all these different people and they're doing one aspect. There's, I'm doing everything and it's all made from scratch. And it's, it's, you're basically paying for the prep time, you know. Uh, and so, so, yeah, it's, I, I, unfortunately, MasterChef and, and MKR or whatever, they're all great. I mean, I don't like those shows personally because I think they're unrealistic but they, I'm, I love that people are more interested in food but unfortunately people still don't get that good food and good service costs money it, it's actually it's a, it's a it's it's not you know the amount of briefs that I get and they want to pay 20 bucks a head for a buffet you know it's like really yeah I'm not your girl because I don't really like doing deep fried stuff so my, my focus is more and food quality well, yeah, and look, to be honest, if to do an organic, then an organic uh, meal, like you can't do it within the budget. So the supplier I use for meat is um, free range. Um, and then I use the local fish that comes up from the fish market. So I don't get any discounts. Like I, I'm not doing big enough jobs to get wholesale. Again, that's the difference between a restaurant or a large caterer than me. Um, and then the projects to do yeah. organic, well, that's virtually impossible to do 100% organic. My dry stores are all organic. Um, so I think there has to be compromises, but that's always been my ethos too with people. Uh, I did a workshop a few weekends ago and I'm like, you know, if you're making a ferment and you can't get an organic cabbage, don't let that be what stands in your way. Cause it's still going to have some nutritional value. Don't let perfect. Yeah. It's good, yeah. And I mean, you're, you're really, you know, you're really no bullshit about it all too. I, I've always said, just do your best. 
you know, and if you don't have the finances to, to eat like that, then maybe eat less meat and eat less chicken and try and buy it from the supermarket free range or whatever, or eat kangaroo or something that you can get that's okay. But don't, yeah, don't let it stand in your way. So with the jobs, and look, I would say if you went to a restaurant, unless it is like a vegan organic restaurant, it, it's, that's all coming from traditional sources, all that stuff, you know. So it, it's, yeah. So I, I cook and I do it because, again, it so still feeds into that ethos of seeing people when you put out a buffet especially and they go, wow, and then they all go dig in. It's just there's something about that, that, that offering that you can share with people. It's gorgeous. So um, I love yeah. it. And so I still cook. Yeah. I don't know how I'm going to sustain it, you know. It's, it's a lot of work. It's really physically, uh, physically challenging. Um, but, yeah, that's probably my main, it's probably my main income stream at the moment. And then the products, um, which are called Alchemy, because, <laughs> you know, that's really what they are. As you know, I have a hippie story around that. They kind of came through me from spirit. And the first one was the one that we met over, the Shakti Superfood Blend, which is now called Super Greens. And literally, I just got back to Australia and suddenly I was told, go online and, in my head, find spirulina and investigate it. And then, you know, it just sort of keeps unraveling. And then I sort of sit down and write down what is I'm seeing when I'm getting the information on. And next thing you know, this is born. And so that was around for a while and had really quite a good market share back then. And then... I always had a vision for these other products, but didn't know when, when, that would, when the market would be ready. And suddenly the market moved faster than me because it takes a lot of work to do that sort of development part and then the designing. And so now the, the product range is five or six things. It's even, I can't remember. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, I love it. And the reason I keep with it is I know how good it is, how really, truly... Uh, in integrity it is but I find it very hard to keep hustling you know it's a hustle when you've got a product and, and you don't have lots of money behind it you know to go out yeah. there and have a face of it and, and all that sort of stuff it's it's hard work and uh, it's just me yeah you know but they're beautiful and they're and they're yeah. super high frequency and that's always my thing is the food and the blessing of the food and all that stuff and the, and the intentions it's all of a vibration that they're going to feel. And people write to me and they go, why do I feel so? I'm like, oh, it's the frequency. <laughs> but it's true. What do you yeah. think? Yeah. And I mean, they're all incredible ingredients as well. Like you're using really um, healing medicinal ingredients in those products too. You're not just, you know, grinding up some kale and Broccoli. Know, something else and putting it in a jar and going, there's your... Yeah, well, my, my ethos always with the greens was that if you can get it from the store and eat it, then do that. But you can't buy spirulina when you can, but not that easily fresh. Um, and, you know, bee pollen, all those things, they're not foods that you can eat in your diet. And then when you combine that particular formula, it's really quite potent, you know. And again, with these foods, when you're making these formulas or creating these formulas, there has to be a certain amount Sorry, you have to consider whether it's going to be TJA or what's called functional. Um, because if you take it to a certain level of thera therapeutic potency, then it's going to have to be approved by the TJA, which is a whole other ball game. And these foods are off, they're foods, they're not, they don't need to be TJA approved at the potency that they're in, but it's still very potent. And I was also very clear that I didn't want to use sweeteners. Like, I really detest stevia, I don't like the mouth, the, the taste in my mouth. Taste like and I can chemicals. taste it for days. Like it's, I just, just I despise it, and well, I think it's really hard to find a. It's I so can't. strong that, you know, if in the blending it ends up all in one part, then you're just going to ruin it. And also, I don't like the idea of using other fake sugars. My attitude was always, if you really the bee pollen is sweet, the mesquite's got a sweetness, the maca's even got a bit of a sweetness. If you really detest it, then add something yeah. sweet yourself. Like, I don't need to make it palatable for you no. and still know that it's really good. And it's actually very neutral. I mean, you've taken the super green straight. It's neutral. Oh, absolutely. And I would even say, like, yeah, you could just mix it in water and just chug it down. It's not a big deal. But, I mean, add a spoonful into a smoothie. It's not going to 
it's not going to overpower no. the flavor not like straight spirulina or chlorella and they're all very potent things oh. you know? that's how you should take it actually but they're also so <clears> potent <throat> that you don't need to have tablespoons of them a day you need small amounts to get those you know micronutrients in your that's life. right and i i think <clears throat> they all have very beneficial uh, factors within them nutritionally and then together they all do they're all protein sources like some more than other I mean spirulina is the highest plant-based protein on the planet you literally could live on spirulina and bee pollen you'd be fine so if there's a the shit goes south soon come to me you'd have you'd have b12 deficiency yeah. but you'd well, be fine okay yeah well if shit goes south and that's all you're living on who cares about the b12 at that point you just be happy to have the spirulina. Um, sure. But, I mean, again, the Aztecs or the ancients, yeah. they were using these as, as pure food sources in their times of worrying or whatever. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay, maybe not quite full spectrum. But I think, I think my attitude with the greens was most people don't get enough greens in their diets. And what's a simple way to at least get like, the chlorophyll and to get the, the micronutrients? Yeah, absolutely. With the, with the um, Vitality Elixir, that was more because I always knew that MSM was really, really important. And I think, what is it, the third or fourth most important mineral in the body? Um, something like that. That one's yeah, got the, the aloe in Yeah, it as well. which is Isn't sort of more for the, the gut. Yeah, really like and then the one. rosehip and lime because it's a cofactor for MSM. And then lacuna because it's L-dopa. It's, yeah. it's a precursor to dopamine. Um, and again, you know, these... I wanted to do that years ago, but no one was, that was like way out of the comf comfort range. But of course, as yeah. all of these products have become hip. That's one of my favorite. Yeah, the products. Vitality. That's one of my favorite ones. Yeah. And look, yeah. and those things are all Big sort net. of now more common, you know. So Makuna, is, you can buy Makuna by mm. itself. makuna has got, it's Ayurvedic, you know. It's, it's, it's a big thing in the Ayurvedic sort of trope. So um, the cacao one, okay, the cacao one has a bit yeah. of coconut sugar just to kind of like... So you don't have to, it's delicious. Delicious though. Um, but it has really good things like reishi, you know. And again, wanted to do the mushrooms years ago, but no yeah. one was doing mushrooms then. It was like two out of it, two out there. Um, and the hemp. And such a big thing now, aren't they? Yeah. The Which again. Mushrooms. Yeah. And hemp, yes, again, well beyond your time. Well, I wanted hemp. to do hemp with the original super greens, but we weren't allowed to. So originally I wanted hemp in that formula. But we just, there's no way you could do it. Yeah. So, and then by the time the hemp thing got good to go, everyone had, had been in R&D for so long waiting for this legislation to pass. So I was a bit behind the times. I really like the hemp formula that I've created though, because it's got medicinals, the botanicals, mm -hmm. and it's really good for adrenals, which you think about a lot of people who are doing all of the working out and stuff. <laughs> Listen to me, the working out, because she doesn't do it. I don't do it. They need adrenal support, you know, and so the Tulsi. But it's not even just you know, people working everybody. out all the time. It's people who are <clears throat> stressed. Like everybody is just stressed to the max with work, with family, with their friends, with all that sort of stuff. You need that adrenal support, and Tulsi is amazing. Yeah, for that Tulsi, sort of and thing as well. what's the other product in there, Sharon? Um, ashwagandha. Well, the mushroom. Ashwagandha. Yeah, and Char and Char Char yeah. amazing. Ashwagandha is too. like, yeah. So I, this formula, yeah. I had um, two amazing naturopaths that I know um, to, um, give their feedback as well. And so we made sure there was enough to make it a tonic effect. Yeah. So it's not, again, therapeutic. It's just enough to kind of be yeah. always bathing the system. But, um, but you can taste yeah. the Tulsi. It's got that very anise kind of flavor. You've got the hemp protein. It's quite yeah. fish, isn't it? Yeah, and I um, I also drink Tulsi tea sometimes if I'm feeling particularly stressed um, and I put shit tins of lemon in there because it has got a pretty funky flavour to it. Like it can be quite strong, especially if you're drinking it as a tea. It can be quite strong. Um, but I'm sort of of the opinion too of like when I know my body needs something and I just need calming or I need like just I don't care what it tastes like, it's going in and I'll just cop it for a period of time. Even though I'm a foodie and I love things to taste good, when there's certain things that I'm thinking, this is a tonic, this is an elixir, this is something that I just need to support my body, mate, give me a cup of mud. I will so down good. it and then move on with my day and make sure everything else in the you're day so tastes good. good. You're so good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the Tulsi, you think about it, it's holy basil. So it's it's got it like, it's like a stronger strain. So if yeah. you, you tick, you know, when your basil's flowering, 
you take a piece of that, it's got that really strong anise mm. kind of flavour. But my attitude was, no, it has to stay at that amount because it must. Like, again, everyone would say, no, no, you've got to make your formulas to the public. I'm like, no, it's got to be this way. And they'll just have to catch up with it. Um, but you, you wanted to have some yeah. sort of therapeutic um, benefits, you know, or medicinal benefits or, as you say, tonic benefits. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And hemp, I mean, hemp again, an amazing product and sustainable, you know. So all the, all the, all the ingredients yeah. except for the ones that can't be are organic. Like bee pollen, it's, it's wild crafty. Yeah. And the chaga yeah. and the reishi as well. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. Um, I'm, and I'm really proud of them. I'm proud of the creations. Um, but as you well know, Shan, just not, I'm not very savvy, savvy with the marketing of them. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah. yeah, but I think all that sort of stuff is hard. Like you, we're in a market that gets saturated really, really quickly. And, you know, you get all of these beautiful, um, you know, handcrafted products that get created and they come onto the market. And then every man and their dog, like, I don't know, More Life or, you know, all of these big companies kind of go, oh, we need to do a medicinal mushroom product because mm. everyone else is doing it. We'll mm. make it cheaper we'll be able mm. to buy it all in bulk and you kind of get just shafted mm. out of the market and you've got these amazing you know artisan products that all of a sudden are just dumped out because people can buy what they think is mm. an equivalent on the mm. shelf at Coles or Woolies mm. because some random big brand makes it and you know the quality is probably not the same the the medicinal properties mm. are not the same but it looks mm. kind of the same um, in terms of, you know, what the ingredients are. Are they in there in the same ratios? Probably not. Are they the right quality of ingredients? Probably not. Is it full of sweetness? Probably. But for people who don't understand, they're kind of like, oh, yes, no, I did see that beautiful, you know, artisan handcrafted, you know, beautifully, you know, naturopath created product. And it was 40 bucks for a jar. But there's this one on the shelf at Coles and it's, it looks like it's got the same ingredients mm. in it and it's exactly. 12 bucks. Exactly. And that's the thing. So I, yeah. I dropped my, and again, a lot of people don't know either. When we sell, well, especially to the chains, we don't want to talk about the margins on that. But I sell, say you're a small retail store. Well, you're going to get a, a huge margin as well. So I can't even price yeah. my products to make them more viable if I also want to sell them in retail, you know? So it's really tricky. Yeah. So you, you still have, and you, and you need to make something yeah. from it, you know, like you can't do it for free. Absolutely. Yeah. It's so apparent. it's, it's really tricky. Like my, the prices of the super greens, actually all of the products, they haven't gone up in like two or three years. You know, the other, pro the, the new, all the new range, yeah. new meeting two years ago, hasn't gone up at all, you know, but I'm having to still pay even the packaging, the labels alone. They're all, especially cause I'm a small producer, then it's like $4, uh, uh, a pouch just to label it it's ridiculous you know because of the gold or whatever because mm. of the copper so again i think it's it's really challenging because unfortunately the consumer which and it's not it's not their fault it's not even it's not ignorance they just don't know don't understand what it takes to do that yeah and so then yeah as you say you see a nature's way or something or blackmores and they come out with this stuff and you're like well what do you do or a brand that maybe let's just say has a really famous face fronting it you know, what do you do? You know, like, 100%. I don't look like that model who fronts the other greens, but you know, like, what do you do? So I kind of, I kind yeah. of like, again, I, you know, I get channels from star pit beings and all that sort of stuff, Shan, you know, all that crazy stuff I do. And they, what they say is you just have to keep going because what you've got has inherent goodness and the people that need it will get it. And so it's kind of one of those things where, at some point yeah. I had to make a decision whether I put all my energy into the products or all my energy into the food. And I don't know, just along the way, the, sort of the, the catering kind of started to pick up. And so I love them equally. And also then I have all of the Native American stuff and I do all my work for my teacher as service. It's all, I do it for free. And that takes up actually a, quite a substantial chunk of each year, you know? So I don't, I, I don't want to yeah. let any of them go. And, I'm, and I often, feel uh, um i'm in a quandary around that you know because uh, they're all good things that yeah yeah um, yeah but i mean if you can juggle them all yeah keep juggling. juggling something will break i don't know it's been a really i don't, I don't know about you but it's been a really intense time for a lot of people 
uh, the last sort of, you know, six to 12 months. And I feel like for me, something is, there's some things are going to shift and not saying that things will fall away, but I think there'll just be a shifting of the priorities or the way I approach things. And I'd like to do more healing work as well. Cause I, I mean, I have all these healing tools in my toolbox and I'd like to start doing some of the more private work and work with women work. Uh, I think we were talking about in the call before, you know, work with women in menopause and things like that, but using these tools that I have to help them explore that or, or navigate it. Yeah. 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 What do you think yeah. about that? Well, I might let you go. Thank you so much for today. I will make sure I put all of the links um, down below so everybody can find you. And then also I'll pop this up onto YouTube later on today and we'll pop all the links in there too. So everyone can kind of hang out. <laughs> Thank you. you so much for letting me ramble on like that. I told you I could uh, talk you, dude. Oh, no. I appreciate it very um, much. Thank you so much for your support of me over these years, Shan, and, and uh, just being such okay. a cool chick. And I'm really glad that um, your life is looking so amazing <laughs> at the moment. It makes me, it makes me feel very happy. Oh, you know what? It, oh, um, thank yeah. you. Thank you. It is good. I'm actually really, really happy right now. I think I've just got, I've got lots going on and there's a lot of hustling happening, but you know what? Uh, there's, I think everyone has stuff, don't they? Everyone's got shit in their life. It's just different shit. And, you know, I think at times that overwhelms all of us and there's things that get us down. But you know what? For the most part, I've got so much to be grateful for that it's really hard to be down about anything for too long because I'm surrounded by amazing people and great opportunities. And, yeah, I'm just, I, I do feel very, very grateful for... Um, for all the good and that's stuff. That's what they say, that's honey, happening. in AA. Attitude of gratitude. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much and <laughs> hopefully I never end up hopefully I never end up in AA to need to use that, but I You can just use it, it in anyway. the in the general, you know, having an attitude of gratitude, yeah, you know, just give thanks. And um and yeah, I I hope I hope to see you again here soon. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, you, I will darling. talk to see you ya. soon. Bye. Thanks, Jack.